Hey you guys, welcome to Sandals Church. We are all about this vision of being real. So no matter who you are or where you're watching from, there is a place for you here. And if you want to dive deeper and look at what the vision of being real looks like in your life, I have to tell you to check out the Debrief podcast, where you can go to debrief.show to catch up on old episodes and what's to come. So make sure to check that out. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Sandals Church. Thank you very much. Thank you. Man, it's good to be here. How many of you guys like to watch Christmas movies at Christmas? Anybody? Okay, like we have our movies. Like my wife likes to watch black and white movies. My favorite movies, uh, number one, Elf, right? Because I've always felt a little off, so (laughs) I identify with him and his struggle. Uh, Home Alone makes me feel good. I've never left a kid in another city, right? And then family vacation, Christmas vacation, I mean, because I never want to be that weird of a dad. But I like watching those movies. So here's the struggle. There's a lot of you, you know, you you, you know those stories, you know those movies. And so here's what's happening in our culture. As we become more and more secular, and what that means is non-religious, as we move away from religion, we identify holidays, which used to mean holy days, more with secular cultures, stories. Look, there's nothing wrong with Elf. There's nothing wrong with Home Alone. Uh, There's nothing wrong with, you know, Christmas vacation. The problem is many of you only know those stories. You don't know the story. You don't know the reason for the season. Now, if you're under 30 years old, you guys, your generation is moving so quickly away from church, so quickly away from God. And many people have no idea what Christmas is all about. And so what I want to do today is I want to invite you into the Christmas story. Like a lot of you guys know that at Christmas we buy gifts, we give gifts. A lot of you have no idea why. Where where does that start? Where does that come from? Why is that the Christmas tradition? And then I'm gonna invite you at the end of service not just to give a gift, but to give hope. To give hope to people who don't know how much God loves them. To don't know, who don't know what God has done for them and don't have literally any idea of how they're gonna get through life. And we have an opportunity to give towards that. So let me pray over you. And here's what I'm gonna pray, that you would hear God's words today and that the Christmas story would challenge you and would change your heart and you would know the reason for the season. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you would just... Fill this place with your spirit, God, and you would touch our hearts in such a way, God, that we could be the kind of generous that you want us to be at Christmas, and Lord, we could give the kind of gifts that make a difference. So Lord, bless this time. Lord, I don't know what people are going through. I don't, I don't know what's happening in their lives, but you do, and I pray that this message somehow touches their life. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, take a look at your notes in front of you. If you're a guest, you can download the Sandals app, and here's what's cool. You have the whole sermon and the answers. The answers are already there, so you never miss a blank. But, you know, follow along, and, and really the, the notes kind of keep me on track because <laughs> I have ADD, but it's a lot of fun. So let's take a look at the Gospel of Matthew, and this is Matthew's story of the Christmas story. On Christmas Eve, we're going to look at Luke's story, but today we're looking at Matthew's story, and they, they tell the same story from different angles. So in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, it says Jesus was born in Bethlehem. I want you to write in your notes, Jesus is a real person. He's a real person born in a real place. It's not made up. He's a historical person. There's more evidence for the the reality of Jesus than there is for Abraham Lincoln. Now, nobody in here doesn't believe in Abraham Lincoln, and yet many people choose to not believe in Jesus. He's a real person born in a real city during a real time. During the reign of King Herod, not only do we know where he was born, but we know about when he was born, during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands 
arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? These guys are not Jews. They're either Arab or they're Indian or they're from Persia. We don't know. They're, they're somewhere from the east. Where is the king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Why is everybody afraid? Because when you have two kings, you're gonna have one great war. Whenever there's two kings, you have one great war. And let me tell you why that matters. Okay, if Donald Trump and President Xi of China can't get along, guess what that means? Some of us die. It affects us. When leaders don't get along, when leaders fight, everyday normal people die. So people are freaked out. Wait a minute, there's a new king. We also have an old king. And so they're all upset. He called a meeting with the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. This is hilarious. Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Anybody ever feel like or wish you knew your Bible a little bit better? None of you? Okay, you're all, you're all scholars. You're all, Pastor, I study the Bible every day. I was reading it before I came here today. How unfortunate is that that you're the king of Israel and you don't even know your Bible? You don't even know where the Messiah is supposed to be born. Listen, and it's not like it's not a big deal. The whole Bible is pointing to this event. The whole Bible from Genesis to the Gospels is pointing to the coming of the Messiah, the chosen one. It's a big deal. It's like the main point, and he doesn't know where he's supposed to be born. So he phones a friend, and he calls all of his religious friends, and they say, Bethlehem, the king will be born in Bethlehem. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. He doesn't want anybody in this meeting. It's just him and the wise men. And he said, he wants to know when the star first appeared. And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Think about this, not Jewish, not Christian, but they're happy because Jesus changes lives. They entered the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. And then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see, the reason we exchange gifts at Christmas is because gifts were exchanged at the first Christmas. It's a part of this. And here's the thing, nowadays, we're all running around for getting gifts of people we hardly know, and everybody forgets Jesus, and it's his birthday. It's his birthday. And we forget, oh my gosh, you know, I forgot Jesus on my list. It's his birthday. And so a lot of you, you know you should give, but you're not sure how. I'm not sure how. Some of you have questions. You're not exactly sure. I don't know about this church thing. I don't know how to give to Jesus. And what I wanna do today is I wanna talk to you about how I believe you should give. And then I'm gonna share with you how Tammy and I give and how we've done it for 20 years. And then at the end of service, I just want you to pray about it. I want you to ask God, God, what do you want me to do? And then whatever God says, you do. So how should I give? Okay, this point, guys, listen to me. I, I love you. I love all you guys but you're a little behind on the, the whole issue of gift giving, let's just be honest. And I'll prove it to you, okay? Women already know this, the answer's thoughtfully. Amen, ladies, you know that. Like when you give a gift, like this is my wife, it'll be June, it'll be June, we'll, we'll be somewhere, my wife will see something, she's like, oh my gosh, this just makes me think of so-and-so, and I'm gonna buy this th for them for Christmas. I have never had that thought in my life. I, I have never been anywhere in June and thought of any of you. I've just, I've just <laughs> never, ever thought that, right? Guys, I will prove to you that women are better at gift givers. I bet Sandals Church is 20,000. That means about 9,000 are guys because there's more women at Sandals than, than men because they're more spiritual than us, okay? But listen to me, I bet there isn't a guy at Sandals Church out of the 9,000 men that come here that gets together at Christmas with their buddies to exchange gifts. <laughs> hey, Fred, Jim, Bob, you know what I was thinking we could do? We could get together once a year and exchange gifts and express our love for one another. Ladies, you'll get friends just so you can give a gift, <laughs> right? Let's all get together. You have multiple parties, multiple friends, and you exchange gifts. Oh my gosh, that's why all of us guys are broke, amen? We're like, <laughs> stop having friends. 
So here's the thing. Women are way better at gift giving. So guys, I'm gonna help you out. I was a terrible gift giver, okay? I was a terrible gift giver. Tammy and I had, we said some just <laughs> wonderful fights about my lack of generosity early on. And so I found this book called The Love Languages, and it really, really helped me. It's called The Five Love Languages. It helped me to figure out how to give gifts to people. And so let me run through the five love languages real quick, and then we'll look at the kind of gift the wise men gave. The five love languages, right? The first gift, the first kind of person you give to is the physical touch person. Not everybody likes physical touch. Write that down. You can't touch everyone. Write that down. If you just touch random people, you're gonna go to jail. Some people like physical touch. Like, I don't know if you can tell, but I got a haircut. Yeah, some of you are like, I hate it. Well, okay. My favorite part of the haircut is the hair wash. I don't know what happens. I don't know if haircut people take classes in magic. I don't know what it is. But man, they put you in that awkward sink. Who designed that? Is it for giraffes? I don't understand, right? Nobody's neck is like that long. They put you in that terrible sink that like will break your neck and you're just all uncomfortable and it's weird and then they start touching you and you're like, oh. <laughs> this last haircut, I'm not kidding. I think I was drooling at the end. I was just like, ah. I just do it again, run it again. I don't think you got it all. And I've tried it, like right, well, now I'm gonna massage your temples. Like I've done this in the shower, it does not feel good. I don't know what it is. It's amazing. But if you buy a gift for somebody, like you give them a massage and they hate physical touch, that's lame. Like, they don't, they're not, they don't like your gift. They think you're weird. Some people are physical touch. Some people are not. Next, some people are quality time. Don't buy them a coffee mug. Who has too many coffee mugs? Raise your hands. Tammy and I have been mugged by coffee mugs. We have too many in our house, right? Okay, you know what a person whose who's love language is quality time? They don't want a mug. They want coffee with you. And some of you parents, man, you're running around, you're trying to find something on Amazon and all your kid wants is you. They just want some time with you. They don't want, they don't want a, a mitt, you know, a glove and a ball. They want to play catch with their dad. They just want some time. They just want to hang out with you. And some of you are missing it. You're not looking at the person. They just want to spend time. And the next kind of person that experiences love is it's called acts of service. Okay, they don't, they don't want anything from you, but if you did something for them, that, they would love that. Like for example, I'm wearing this watch right now, and I love this watch for two reasons. Number one, I bought it for myself. Number two, because, and this is, I'm not kidding you, I don't make this up, it doesn't work right now, because it needs a battery, but I still wear it because it looks cool. And so my daughter, two years ago, said, Dad, what's something I could give, give for you? I said, you wanna do something for me? She said, yeah, I said, get a battery for my stupid watch. And so she took my watch, she took it to the watchmaker, she got a new battery, she put it under a tree, and I opened the watch that I bought for myself, and I felt so loved. <laughs> you know why? I don't want to go to a watchmaker. Those people are weird. What do they do in there? Like they wear the funny glasses and they're tinkering. I don't know what's happening in there. I'll send my daughter, right? <laughs> so two years ago, she put a, a battery in this watch, and if she's thinking of ideas for this Christmas... Let's run it back. All right. <laughs> this next one is huge, and I'm, ter I'm terrible. Words of affirmation. My wife is so into words of affirmation, she affirms herself with words. <laughs> she comes home, you want to know what I did today? I was like, well, you're going to tell me. What'd you do? I was so awesome. So here's the thing. If you know somebody that's words of affirmation, guys, I'm going to save you some money in counseling right now. This is for free. Here's what I've learned with my wife. You can't just have one word of affirmation. You have to have a word, and then you have to have a backup word. Because here's why. My wife will ask me, do you like this dress? And I'll say, yes. And then she'll say, what do you like about it? See, some of you guys aren't ready for the backup. You gotta have the, you gotta have the follow-up compliment. I really like the colors. Either way, I like the way it brings out your eyes. Oh. That's awesome. Yeah. You gotta be careful too, guys, because sometimes it's a setup. You like this? Yeah, I love your dress. I'm wearing pants. What? <laughs> you actually have to look first. Listen to me. If there's somebody in your life that their words of affirmation, you don't have to buy them a gift. Send them a card. And actually write words in it yourself. You see, some of you guys, you're standing there like, I'm looking for the perfect card. They just want to hear what you think. I'm not kidding you. My wife is so words of affirmation. You know what we do at our house on birthdays? 
when it's your birthday, everybody in the family says things they love about you. And it's hard, you gotta come up with it. You're like, oh, it's gotta be good. <laughs> My kids all wanna go first now, so now the good stuff doesn't get taken. They're like, I'll go first. <laughs> but we just say that. Because you know we live in a world where people are not affirmed? Hey, I love this about you. Hey, I appreciate about this about you. Hey, I think these things are amazing about you. See, the problem is the world measures us and the things we do wrong. When's the last time somebody just spoke some things over you that you do right? It's beautiful. Words of affirmation. And the last one is gifts, man. Some people just love gifts. Man, I was thinking of you. I thought about you. I got you this little thing. Like my mom loves gifts. She loves gifts. Doesn't matter what it is. My mom still has stuff that I made when I was four years old. I'm pretty sure it's toxic stuff. She's got it on the tree. It's kind of embarrassing, too, because I've become a better artist since when I was four. This is what your pastor did. We put it on the tree. You're like, I think pastor has a drinking problem. What's, what, what is that, man? My mom just loves it. You know why? Because it was a gift. It was a gift. She loves things. And so think about that, right? And think about how the Lord gave to us at Christmas. Physical touch, he came. He came physically, right? Quality time, he hang out. What did he, how did he call the disciples? He said, hey, let's spend three years together. Think about that, right? All the ways that the Lord gave to us, acts of service. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as ransom for many. Words of affirmation. For God so loved the world, he so loved you that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then finally, gifts. Jesus gave his life for you. He died so you could live. God knows who we are. He knows what we need. So let's take a look at how should we give. We should give thoughtfully. Let's, some of you have never thought about this. Like you know the song, we three kings of Orient are. Like you know that song, but you've never thought about why did they, why did they give what they gave? So what was the gold for? Some of you have never thought about this, but the gold financed his escape to Egypt. When we read through the story, remember what Herod asked? Herod asked the wise men, when precisely did you see the star? You wanna know what Herod wants to know? How old is this kid? How old is this kid? So when he sends his troops to Bethlehem, Herod kills every male born child two years and under. So Joseph and the wise men are warned in a dream. The wise men are warned not to tell King Herod and Joseph is warned to flee. Listen to me, some of you guys are young men and you're trying to figure out how to be dads. You're trying to figure out how to do work. You're trying to figure out how to support a family. I want you to imagine, you just found out you're gonna be a dad, right? But now all of a sudden you can't support your son doing what you've always done because you're a carpenter in Nazareth. Now you gotta go to Egypt. You gotta go to a place where you got no family, you don't speak the language, you don't understand the culture, you may not be able to get a job. How are you gonna pay for your son? The wise men brought gold and financed his trip to Egypt and his upbringing. Think about that. And some of you are like, well, well if God's gonna send his own son, why didn't he just send him rich? It's not like they don't have gold in heaven. The Bible says they have so much gold in heaven, they pave their streets. Like here in Riverside, we, don't, we can't even pave potholes. <laughs> like there's a shortage of asphalt. We got none. In heaven, they got gold. Well, I don't know what to do with it. Just use it on the street. It's not like they don't have money in heaven. So why did God send Jesus to the earth to be poor? So he would know what it's like to be you. Right? I mean, I don't know about you, but Tammy and I, we don't have a pile of cash in some room. We're like, we don't know what to do with this. <laughs> Jesus was the same way. He came with nothing. And he depended upon the generosity of people. Next, frankincense. Frankincense has been used for thousands of years as a symbol of wealth and as a perfume. The frankincense was to anoint him as king. It's saying this little boy, and I know your Bibles say, was born in a manger. It's actually a cave. He's born in a cave, surrounded by animal poop and bizarre 
shepherds who saw something, <laughs> right? We saw something. What have you been drinking? It was a crazy night. And they anointed this little poor kid in Bethlehem in a cave as the king of the Jews. The next gift, myrrh. Myrrh is also a spice, but it's used in death. Myrrh was used to wrap him with this at death in royalty. That's kind of an odd gift, right? Your child's born and somebody shows up with a gift. This is for them when they're dead. But you know what? Jesus didn't come to live. He came to die for you so you could live forever. And they brought this for him. They brought this. Think about how comforting that must have been to Mary when he was crucified. Still got that jar of myrrh, remembering this is what it was always about. This is why he came, holding that jar, remembering, yep, this is why we kept this. This is what this is for. He came to die so we could all live. So I wanna challenge you to give thoughtfully. You should think about it. And let's be honest. Whenever you talk about money, if you're married, like you wanna fight, talk about money. Like if you're like, we haven't fought in a while, talk about money. If you're single, you wanna fight with yourself, think about money, right? I wanna encourage you to think about what you give, whether you're married or single. You need to think about it. You need to talk about it. Next, you need to give cheerfully. The Bible says you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, right? You should never feel manipulated. You should never feel pushed. You should never feel guilty. If it's guilt, it's not God. Like think about it, every week during the offering, I could play that pet adoption song in the back in the arms of an angel and I just, you know. We don't do that. Why? Because God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Look, I love to give. Look, Tammy and I have bills. We don't consider our tithes and offerings a bill. You know what you do with bills? You pay them off. Man, just like last month, we finally paid off our last car payment. Like we have no more car payments, right? Yes, woo! Okay, I didn't even tell Tammy I did this, but this is between us girls, right? Listen. I paid our last car payment and I did this. I don't know why I did it, but you know, I don't like them saying you have to pay, you have to pay, you have to pay. So I overpaid. That way they have to send me a check. I really did that. I was like, you guys are gonna send me a check. And I thought about it in 30 days, I'm gonna call them. You realize you're late. I bet somewhere at Nissan, they got an accounting meeting. They're like, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> he overpaid, I only overpaid $8. I didn't wanna make it a lot. <laughs> Pray for Tammy, she's married to me. <laughs> it's called fun bill paying with Pastor Matt. But I love that, right? I'm, I'm gonna pay off all my debt. I'm never gonna pay off God. It's not like last year, well, I don't tell Tammy this year, you know what, I got you gifts every year for 22 years. This year, I'm taking it off. You know why I like to buy gifts for Tammy? Because I love her. You know why I love to give gifts to the Lord? Because I love him, I love doing it, right? I love doing it. Here's the problem this year, guys. All my Christmas shopping is already done. I already bought everything for Tammy. The problem is I'm so excited to give it to her. I bought it too soon. This last week, she was a little grumpy. I was like, you better watch it because I know what's under the tree. And that could turn into some coal. So let's rally together. No, no, right? I, I just, I just, I, it's killing me. It's killing me. My kids are like, what'd you get, mom? I'm like, I'm not telling anyone. It's so exciting. Next, you gotta give regularly. Oh my gosh, some of you guys, you know all this gray hair? It's from you. You're like, that was a good sermon today, pastor. I'm gonna give a little bit. And then the next week, you're like, yeah, I didn't connect. Man, some of you guys, look, part of growing up is just paying bills. Like when I got my first apartment, my roommate, all he wanted to be was a rock star, super talented guy, terrible at bill paying. And so every month I would come to him and say, hey, Andrew, it's time, it's time to pay the rent again. And he'd be like, bro. He'd take his headphones off, he's playing the guitar, bro. He's like, I feel like we just paid the bills. I'm like, we did, we just paid it 30 days ago. 
And we're gonna pay it now, and we're gonna pay it 30 days later, and 30 days after that. He's like, you're messing with my groove. I just wanna be a rock star. I'm like, that's never gonna happen. And yet, he is the lead guitarist for Switchfoot. And I was like, ah, I blew that. <laughs> we ought to get him to tithe now. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> I think I blew that opportunity. So it's gotta be regular. Some of you guys, listen to me, I love you. You're giving at Sandals Churches like this. Do you have any idea how hard it is to make a budget when people give like this? It's impossible. Like I have to build a budget every single year anticipating what you're gonna give. Do you, do you understand why I'm gonna die very early? <laughs> like, like, that, like what am I doing? Right, it's crazy. I told my wife this week, I said, we're just gonna get jobs. Can you imagine if you got paid at work the way you give? Your boss is like, you've done good this week. I'm praying about it. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You gotta give regularly. So Tammy and I, for the last 20 plus years, we are what's called tithers. Some of you don't know what that is. You're like, what's tithing? Well, it's not tithing. <laughs> it's called tithing. And some of you, you know, you've grown up in church, you've heard about it. Um, you know, and let me just say this. If you're gonna give money, you need to know why and you need to know what the Bible says about it. And a lot of people don't know either. And so even if you're a visitor today, I don't expect you to give, but now you know what the person that brought you should be doing. Just look at him. It's like, well, that's a good message. <laughs> what do you think? All right. So why am I a tither? Well, here's why. Write this down. Abraham started it. Some of you guys don't know who Abraham is. Abraham is credited with starting the Muslim religion, the Christian religion, and the Jewish religion. That's a fairly significant spiritual dude, right? So Abraham, great dude. He had an idiot for a nephew. His nephew's name is Lot. Lot is always screwing up. Lot wouldn't know a good choice if it stared him in the face. Lot constantly does his own thing, goes his own way, literally gets conquered, destroyed. His whole life is a mess. And why? Because he spends his life not listening to God and not listening to Abraham. And one particular time, Lot is captured and sold into slavery, and Abraham goes to rescue his nephew. And he wins the battle, and he wins his, his nephew Lot back. He wins all the spoils back, all the horses, all the people, all the servants, everything back. And then this weird dude, nobody knows who he is. He's only mentioned three times in the Bible, once in Genesis, once in the book of Psalms, and then in the book of Hebrew in reference to Jesus. His name is Melchizedek. He's one of the creepiest, freakiest, bizarro dudes, creepy is the wrong word, just mystic guy. We're not sure who he is. Here's what the Bible says. Melchizedek had no beginning and has no end. We don't know where he came from. We don't know where he's going. But Melchizedek, the king of Salem and priest of God most high, shows up. Melchizedek, in Hebrew, the way you say king is melech. He's Mel, melech, kizedek. He's the king of righteousness, who also is the king of Salem, which is where we get our word shalom. He's the king of righteousness, and he's the king of peace. He's the king of peace. Oh, and by the way, he's the priest of the one true God. Who does that sound like? Who is it? Does anybody know somebody that we worship as Christians who's the king of righteousness and the king of peace and oh, by the way, he's also a priest? His name is Jesus. And he brought Abraham, Abram at this point, some bread and wine. Does anybody remember how we remember Jesus? We break bread. And we don't sip wine at sandals, but we take a grape symbolizing wine in remembrance of him. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing. He said, blessed be Abram, by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has defeated your enemies for you. And then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. This is where tithing starts. It starts with the founder of our faith, Abraham, and this guy named Melchizedek. And here's what's weird. There are two priestly lines in the Bible, and I know a lot of this is, you're gonna be like, whoa, I didn't even know there was one priestly line. But Moses, his priest is named Aaron, and all the priests in the Old Testament come from what's called the Aaronic priesthood. Now, Jews don't use that word anymore. If you have Jewish friends and their last name is Cohen, what that means is they're from that line. 
they come from that family. You see, the Hebrew word for priest is Kohen. Kohen. And it means they're from that line. Jesus is not from that line. He's from a different priestly line. And oh, by the way, there's only two priests in this line, Melchizedek and Jesus. Hebrews 6.20 says, Jesus has already gone there for us. Where is Jesus? He's at the right hand of God defending you as we speak. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Why? Because Jesus is the king forever of righteousness who brings peace with God to you. That's who he is. That's what he does. So Abraham started it next. Moses commanded it. He says, you must set aside a tithe of your crops, one-tenth of all the crops that you harvest each year. Bring this tithe, this is key, to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Now, some Christians take 10% and they divide it up. They give some to missions. They give some to the church. They give some to the poor. That's not what Tammy and I do. Tammy and I bring 10% of our salary and we give it to Sandals Church because this is the place where God chooses his name to be honored. For Tammy and I, 10% is not the ceiling of our giving, it is the platform of our giving. It's where we start, it's where we start. You pray about what you do, it's where we start, okay? And I want you to know I'm serious about this. I want you to know I believe Sandals Church literally is changing lives. Sandals Church is making a difference and I love what we give here. And I want you to know I will never ask you to do something that Tammy and I do not do ourselves. Let me give you some good news and then let me give you some shocking news. The good news is last year, 11,273 people, think about that, 11,273 people gave to Sandals Church. Isn't that incredible? It's incredible. Right? Here's the shocking news. Of those 11,273 people, where do you think Tammy and I are on that list? So let's say the 11,273rd person gave a dollar, and let's say the first person gave a million dollars. Here's what the Bible says. Listen to me. The Bible says you're not supposed to tell people what you give because when you do that, you lose your blessing. I'm gonna lose my blessing right now because I wanna bless you. I want you to know that Tammy and I are in this with you. Of all the 11,273 people this year, Tammy and I are number nine on that list. Number nine. Now, don't clap, because if you think we're the ninth richest persons people in this church, you do not know us, and I need to take you for a ride in my Subaru, right? We do it because we love what God is doing at Sandals Church. I want you to listen to me. Even when Tammy and I die, we're gonna double tithe our inheritance to Sandals Church. When we die, we've given 20% of whatever we have left to Sandals Church because we love you guys, and even when I'm in heaven, I want my money working for you. That's my heart. That's who I am. That's what I'm about, okay? All right, enough of that, enough of that, okay? Next, God blesses the tithe. How many of you guys want God to bless you? Raise your hands. Okay, half of you. That always shocks me every time. I, I don't know. Is that a trick question? No, we all want to be blessed. Here's what God said. He said, should, she, should people cheat God? Yet yeah, you've cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? He says, you've cheated me of tithes and offerings Do me. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Underline this, try it, put me to the test. Do you know the Bible actually says you're not supposed to test God unless it's about the issue of tithing? You know why Tammy and I are number nine on that list? Because we're blessed. We're blessed. God has blessed us. We held on to a piece of property for about the last 10 years that 10 years ago, I couldn't have given it away. If I gave it to you 10 years ago, I would owe you money. We held on to it and we sold it this year. We made a ton of money. The Lord blessed us. We haven't even paid our taxes on it yet. We tithed first to God. We gave first to God. Listen to me, God blessed us. I had a worthless piece of property 10 years ago. Not worth anything. God blessed it. You know why he blessed that? I believe because Tammy and I are tithers and we're faithful. We're not rich. We're not even super smart. I mean, you knew that about me. But we're faithful. We're faithful people. 
And we've done that, and God's blessed us. Look, God's taking care of Tammy and I. I want you to know this. We don't even have car payments now. We don't have car payments. We only have a couple more years left on our house. Listen to me, my credit score is 833. And I, my, 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 my social security number has been sold on the dark web. I don't know why you're laughing. But I've had to deal with that. I've had to deal with that issue. Right? There's a construction company in my name in South Carolina that I do not own. Uh, that was strange. <laughs> <laughs> okay, God's blessed us. God's taken care of us. God's watched over us. We've been able to get our kids through college. We've been able to pay off all of our bills. Listen, we're not rich, but God has blessed us. And that's what I want for you. That's what I want for you. I don't want you to be rich just financially. I want you to be rich in your relationship with God. And oh, by the way, I do want you to be rich because you can't give what you don't have, okay? Nobody prays more for you. Man, I want, I want you to get raises. Shoot, I want you to trip over a lottery ticket you did not buy. I want you to have rich relatives you don't even know that die and leave you money. Man, I'm praying for that all the time. I want God to bless your socks off so that we can build this church, so we can do things. Some people tell me, well, Jesus never talked about tithing. And I said, well, that's because you've never listened to Jesus. Jesus actually talks about tithing in both Matthew and Luke. Here's what he says in Luke eleven forty two: What sorrow awaits you, you Pharisees, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income of your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. Underline this. You should tithe what? Yes, but do not neglect the more important things. You know what he's saying? You can give money to God and still be a jerk. So you need to not just give money. You need to let God have your heart. And God needs to change your heart. Next, Tammy and I are tithers because tithing helps me to regularly keep God first in my life. I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to get stupid real quick. It's easy for me to say one thing and do another thing. And tithing is a regular way in my life where I say God's real, God's first, I'm trusting in this. You see, if you wanna know what matters to Matt Brown, check my calendar and look at my checkbook. Those two things will tell you what matters to me. Doesn't matter what I say, it matters what I say on my checkbook and it matters what I say on my calendar. Years and years ago, Tammy and I, we went to buy our first house. We were so excited, not our first house, our first brand new house. Our first house was this like little tiny house, man. You could open the door, close the back door, put the kids to bed, and close the refrigerator without ever moving. It was that small. And we found this house, and we just loved this house. It was brand new. We put down a deposit. We prayed over it. We just knew, we just knew that God was gonna do great things in this house. And see, back in the day, you didn't apply for a loan online. You went and met with a loan officer. And so we met with a loan officer. And we went through all our bills. We talked about what we made. And as he was going through our financial statement, he said, what's tithing? <laughs> I said, well, it's tithing. He says, that's a lot of money. And he, he said, that looks like it's about 10% of your income. I said, yeah, that's what tithing is. It's 10% of your income. And this is what he told us. He said, if you put this down on this piece of paper, you're not gonna qualify for this house. I said, what are you telling me to do? He said, I'm telling you either to quit tithing or I'm, I'm gonna tell you to lie about it to the bank. Can you believe that? So he told me. I said, well, I'm not gonna quit doing that and I'm not gonna lie about it. If God wants us to have this house, we're gonna qualify for it. He said, look, I'm not telling you not to believe in God. He said, I'm your loan officer. I'm telling you, you will not qualify for this house if you put down tithing. Guess what? We didn't get the house. And some of you are like, oh, well, here's the thing. Within two years, that house lost half its value, and Tammy and I would have gone bankrupt if we bought that house. Tithing saved our financial necks. Okay, you know why you're golf clapping? Because it wasn't you. I found this verse. This is an old translation. I love it. It's from the 1970s. It's called the Living Bible. Nobody reads it anymore, but it's a fantastic translation. It says this, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your life. You know what I challenge my kids to do? Tithe. You think it's easy for kids to tithe? Nope. Most things God asks us to do aren't easy, but they are good for us. They are good for us. Nobody goes broke because they give to God. People go broke because they make bad decisions. Investing in God is never a bad decision. 
Next, tithing protects me against guilt and manipulation. You know, people ask me for money all the time. A lot of people think San Jose is a rich church just because we're a big church. Look, we got a campus in San Bernardino, not Newport Beach, amen? Did you know, you, you do know that there's a socioeconomic difference between people in San Bernardino and people in Newport Beach. And if you don't know that, go look at the ships in Newport Beach. Not a lot of ships in San Bernardino. But you know why we have a campus in San Bernardino? Because we don't care what people, what kind of money people make. We care about their souls. That's what we care about. And a lot of people ask me for money. They ask Sandals to get involved in things and give to things. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you why I love tithing. Tithing helps me to understand where my giving always is, and I don't have to give to everything and to everyone. I look at the tithe, and I measure myself based upon that. And you can play your little song and put the little animal in front of my face. You can do all that, but I know whether or not I'm being generous because of tithing. Tithing protects me against guilt and manipulation. Listen to what Paul says. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. He says, I only mean that there should be some equality. I'm gonna make this commitment to you right now. I am never going to live in luxury at your expense. Never. That is not my heart. That is not my goal. That is not who God has called me to be. You are never gonna read an article about some yacht I own in the Bahamas, okay? I may have a fishing boat in Lake Paris, but that's another story. I don't even have that, but it sounded funny. <laughs> okay? I don't want you to give so I can get rich. I want you to give so you get rich. I want you to give so God will bless your socks off. Now, some of you, there's no, there's no way at all. Somebody put a gun to your head, you couldn't think about tithing. You need to come to our financial class, and you need to start figuring out how to do your finances. Tammy and I had to do the same thing. And you need to start paying off bills and you need to start living within your means. And we have a whole class that will help you do that. It says right there, join us for Sandals Church, Hunter Park, for a free financial planning workshop on Saturday, January 11th. You can come to that. Now let's say, let's say you're good at budgeting. Let's say you have plenty of money. And let's say, like me and Tammy, you wanna leave Sandals Church in your, uh, in your inheritance, in your will. Sandals gets 20% of what we give. Here's my prayer. One day, I'm not gonna be your pastor anymore, and there's gonna be another young guy that comes up. Here's my prayer, that we can hand him Sandals Church debt-free. Debt-free. I don't know if you know this, but Sandals Church, we've had to pay for everything ourselves. We didn't get anything from anybody. We've had to raise it, build it, do it all on our own. And it's been very, very difficult. And we've had to take some debt, not a lot, but some debt. My prayer is, prayer is that one day we can pay that off. And what I would just ask you to do is listen, when, when I die and I stand before God on judgment day, I don't want my kids getting new cars. I want God to know that I still love him and while I'm in heaven, my money is still doing his work. That's what I want him to know, amen? All right. And if you're a visitor here today, I'm so sorry. Come next week, we're not talking about money. But we love you. And here's the thing. The church cannot do ministry without financial margin. That's just the truth. That's just the truth. And we gotta learn to give. So thank you for coming. Please come back. I wish I didn't ever have to talk about this, but unfortunately, from time to time, we do. We have to deal with it because it's a real issue and our vision is to be real. So I'm gonna ask the ushers to prepare for the offering. And uh, here's what I want you to do. Pray about it. Make your gifts thoughtful. Make them cheerful. And make them for the love of Jesus and all that is holy. Regular, Amen. Regular, oh my gosh, save me from dying too soon. Okay, let's ask God to bless this. Let's ask God to move in our hearts. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come on out as I pray. Heavenly Father, we pray in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus that you would move, that you would do great things, that you would take these humble offerings and God, you would multiply it in such a way that Sandals Church could run 10 campuses. Lord, could run an internet ministry that reaches hundreds of thousands of people all over the world and we could do this all so we can give hope to people who are lost. Bless us, Father, as we give. Bless our socks off, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys, thanks for listening. 
Sandals Church is a nonprofit that operates from donations from people like you. Because when you donate, your money goes to helping us create places where people can be real. So to donate and be a part of how God moves for the vision of being real, make sure to go to donate.se to make a donation today. Have a great week.